All right. Um, the one thing we have to address today is the school reopening due to the governor's order and the West Virginia State Board of Education's input. Yes, ma'am. So would you like to lead us down this road, Dr. Dixon? Uh, yes, ma'am. We actually have a, a good deal of uh, information to present. Uh, I'm not going to come in and tell you that there is an easy, straightforward answer to this. It's actually a fairly complex situation, but I would like everyone to understand the um, order of operations. So uh, first and foremost, uh, we started down this journey because on January the 11th, the governor of West Virginia issued an executive order um, in which he made a change to uh, his previous policy. Uh, in essence, his executive order conveyed that uh, school systems would no longer be bound by the WVDE color-coded map um, that was derived from the DHHR community map for pre-K through eighth grade students. Um, and that for high school students, they would continue to be bound to the DHHR map only if the county was in red. So essentially the expectation was that beginning January 19th, which is this Tuesday following Martin Luther King Day, that school systems would return to in-person instruction for all pre-K elementary and middle school programs and high school return would be contingent upon the county being any color other than red on the DHHR map. Now, um, as you might imagine that uh, put kicking that back out to uh, local school boards, there was a lot of uh, discussion and consternation. There are a lot of different uh, feelings across the state based on what their community needs are. So yesterday, the uh, West Virginia State Board of Education held an afternoon meeting. And at that meeting, uh, they uh, passed several motions to adopt some parameters for in-person instruction. Um, and uh, those you can find on their website, but uh, to give you the quick version, essentially, um, they said that all pre-K through eight students will resume in-person instruction on January the 19th. Counties do not have the option to implement full countywide remote learning for pre-K to eight students. However, and this is where some folks uh, didn't necessarily read past that, counties and local health departments continue to retain the ability to close individual classrooms or individual schools based on health conditions. So uh, previously under the old system, if there was an outbreak in a particular school that affected our ability to serve students or staff safety in that school, we had the capacity to shut down either an individual classroom, which we have done, or shut down an entire school which we have done uh, based on conference with JCHD, whether it was because of the need for contact tracing or the number of folks quarantined or the number of active cases, we consulted with them and uh, closed that classroom or that facility without affecting the education of all of the other students in the county. County school boards retain that ability. So I wanna be very clear about that. The next part of their order was counties are encouraged to resume in-person instruction four or five days per week on January 19th. And counties have the option to utilize blended instruction models beginning January 19th. Blended models must provide each student with in-person instruction at least two days per week. So following that, there was a meeting of the West Virginia School Board Association last night, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Um, after the West Virginia Board of Education meeting. 
And at that meeting, uh, school boards were given, um, I suppose, uh, uh, WVSBA's advisement about uh, both the governor's order and the State Board of Education's decision and what parameters that placed upon local boards. So they have not yet sent out the minutes of that meeting, um, but I know that uh, you were there, Ms. Skinner, and you may want to speak briefly to what they conveyed to, to local boards. Um, it was pretty much all over the board is what it was. You know, you had some people that were very strongly feeling that we need to return to school full time, five days a week, no questions asked. There were other people that were, you know, concerned about the pandemic. I mean, there's a pandemic, of course. Um, they really did not come to any consensus of what the best path was. The biggest concern was the fact that the decision and influence was passed from the governor to the West Virginia School Board, school, West Virginia School Board. And the school board has a bigger stick over local school boards than the governor does at this point because of the fact that they have the ability to pay for that funding. And, you know, I hate making decisions out of fear, but at the same time, you know, if they're going to hold back the um, the CARES money, I mean, we're scheduled to get, what, over $4 million from that? Close to $4 million. Yep. And um, the um, West Virginia Department of Ed is required to report to the um, state school board on a weekly basis which counties are in compliance and which ones aren't. Um, Mr. Cable, you were there. I mean, did you get any other thoughts or information from it? I mean... I didn't have any more clarity at eight o'clock than I did at six o'clock, to be honest with you. I second that. Okay. Well, the uh, other pieces of information since then are after that meeting, um, I received uh, actually all three counties, uh, Morgan, Berkeley, and Jefferson, received from Dr. Terrence Reedy, who is the chief, chief health officer for the Eastern Panhandle's health department. He sent a letter to each one of the superintendents and school board. And essentially he said in the letter, I cannot answer for you the question whether the intellectual, emotional, social, and physical harm of remaining in school exceeds the harm from not being in school. Child and adolescent development and education are difficult and complicated. <laughs> Um, that's uh, a very appreciate statement of which I believe we were well aware, but um, he then goes on to uh, cover two different positions. One, there are strong reasons to have confidence in the return to in-person learning. Uh, while school was in session, there were no more cases or infection evident in staff or students compared to the general population. Um, there were few cases where infection was thought to occur within the school system. Um, in the school system, there's great attention to the health of others teaching and following the rules regarding isolation and quarantine of infected or exposed students and staff. Due to this attention, there may be less transmission than when people have infection without the school nurses and others who instruct and verify adherence to these guidelines. Most children do very well with COVID-19 infection, with few becoming seriously ill. Many will have no symptoms. Uh, he then goes on to say, there are also great concerns regarding return to in-person learning at this time. It is expected the infection will continue. High rate of spread will occur for several months until enough people have developed immunity. The amount of COVID-19 infection in the community is high and there is not sufficient improvement in behavior to expect a decrease in transmission of the virus. So uh, in essence, he outlines both sides of the issue. Uh, he is correct that there are uh, valid health and study reasons on both sides of that equation. Uh, he then provides uh, charts uh, beginning September, 2020 uh, through current in terms of weekly new cases, weekly number of cases per 100,000 of population. And um, he's simply conveying additional information for the board to be able to make an informed decision. Uh, and the, the 
dual nature of what he conveys is reflected in the feedback that we've received from staff. Um, you saw and heard at the board meeting on Monday, our three uh, union organizations have polled their members with varying rates of um, uh, acceptance or uh, non-acceptance of the, of the safety of going back to school. Um, some of them were 50-50, some of them were 60-40, some of them were 80-20. Uh, so there were varying rates of uh, openness to that concept uh, in terms of folks' uh, comfort. Uh, and in every case, that comfort level increased uh, once uh, the staff had been given both doses. So one of the other pieces of information that we pulled together for the board when looking at this, because the, the vaccine uh, seems to be a point of uh, decision making and concern as well. To date, we have um, provided a total of 583 vaccines. Um, we have a remaining 207 people who have requested the vaccine, but to whom the vaccine has not been delivered. The vast majority of those um, under 40 or uh, a portion of the over 40 who uh, did not uh, get on today's list. The first round was for 50 and over. The second round is 40 and up in the order in which they uh, applied to WVDE. Um, there will not be a vaccine delivery for education staff next week. Next week is the second round for the 80 plus vaccines. So uh, those individuals uh, will be utilizing those vaccines at that time. The following week, so two weeks from um, Monday, that they will resume the first round vaccines for the folks who are remaining uh, for the school systems, okay? Okay, um, the other pieces of information that we felt may be relevant when the board was making their decision. Um, we're all grappling with these same issues, every single school system in the state. This afternoon at 1 p.m., I, I raced back from Jefferson High School and doing vaccines to have a meeting with um, Superintendent Birch and Michelle Blatt and his staff where they provided uh, information and clarity around this issue for all of the uh, state superintendents. So a couple of things that came out of that meeting. Uh, first, the West Virginia Association of School Administrators, which is basically the, the Superintendents Association, had sent out a survey um, after the governor's original order, but before yesterday's Board of Ed meeting. And at that time, 11 counties had said that they had planned to stay on full remote uh, despite the governor's orders. And 26 had said, oh, we're already ready to move ahead with um, uh, in-person instruction in some format, blended, full-time, part-time, but some level of um, on-site instruction. And the remainder were undecided. Um, some boards have indicated that now that the West Virginia Board of Education has made that decision and issued uh, that directive, that they will need to meet again and have an emergency meeting. Uh, the only uh, school board that we're aware of that met after the West Virginia Board of Education's directive and made the decision to stay remote is Berkeley. Um, there may be others, but this situation has been moving so incredibly quickly uh, several boards have voted for full remote, but several of them between the governor's order and West Virginia Board of Education meeting. Um, so today uh, I did ask several questions so that the board had information. Uh, one of the questions was, they had several agenda topics. One of the agenda topics was the ESSER funding, uh, which uh, people refer to as CARES Act funding. 
And yes, we are slated to receive um, a significantly larger amount than we did the first time, nearly $4 million. And I asked specifically whether or not any portion or the um, distribution of those funds would be affected by a school system's compliance with the West Virginia Board of Education directive. The answer that was provided to me was the State Board of Education has asked Mr. Clayton Birch to report to them on Monday and every subsequent Monday which school systems are or are not in compliance with their directive. And then it will be incumbent upon them to determine the extent to which they wish to exercise their authority. And I think you heard very clearly in the WSBA meeting, their authority to um, take action against local school boards who don't uh, comply with their policy decisions. Um, and that may include funding. Um, it may include um, uh, governorship, leadership. The West Virginia uh, Board of Education has the authority to um, uh, take over a school system should they choose. There's no reason to believe that they, are, that they would take such an incredibly drastic action. However, um, it is an untested theory at this point. So um, outside of that, we were reminded, and I think it's prescient for us to know that uh, the uh, next legislative session is due to begin soon. And there are a number of legislators who have uh, an, uh, a vested interest in the educational system in their counties, the education system that they've promised to their constituents that they support uh, and how it functions. So uh, if local boards are making decisions uh, and they're questioned by their legislators about the decisions that they've made and how um, that uh, is affected by legislation or will be affected by legislation, that's something that every board needs to be prepared to do. Um, so the last question that I asked was, uh, and, and Steve Wojtring uh, at Preston started this ball rolling, which I appreciated. Um, there is a short week next week um, because of the holiday. We only have four days. Uh, if a board can show their a plan for compliance with this directive, however, they are unable to get in two full days of instruction for every child beginning the first week, Will, will any penalty apply? And what we were told is we, uh, they felt like there would be a degree of grace for us if we laid out a plan for meeting their directive and that it was not a plan um, intended to subvert that directive. So um, there were discussions about the length of time for a rollout and uh, really where they landed and where the West Virginia Board of Education seemed to feel was defensible in their minds was not to take more than two weeks. They understand next week is a short week. And if you have to change and do something different than what you had originally planned, then having a week to do that, max two weeks to do that, that should be more than sufficient. Um, so I know that is a lot to throw um, at you and to throw at all of the folks who are out here. So before we have any discussion and uh, about this, I guess a couple of things in terms of points of order. Um, number one, uh, we do have some recommendations for the board for you to consider. Uh, number two, I would ask up front that we all recognize there are people who are on very, very different points along a very broad spectrum. And we uh, honor and respect the fact that every single person has a different life story and history and issues that they bring to the table with this about what matters to them and what they believe. 
So we will not with any decision, hard one way, hard the other, middle of the road, there will be unhappiness or frustration, there will be pushback. We will do our very, very best to encompass as many people's needs as we can in as thoughtful a way as we can. And I think if we can have a conversation with some grace and with some respect for everybody's attitudes, then that would be a, in my mind, wonderful and much needed model <laughs> during some very tense and difficult times. So I turn it over to you, Ms. Skinner. That was a lot of data and I'm happy to answer questions from any board members about uh, data or about any other information they were hoping we could gather. And one thing I'd like to say before we do anything or make any decisions is that this is a very fluid situation. And I would like to reserve the right to revisit it at any point in time, no matter what decision is made, just because of the fact that, you know, we don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know what the next day brings. And one of the things that kind of made the hair stand up on the back of my neck was this letter from the health department where he talked about the Eastern Panhandle in particular. Um, we were the first ones in West Virginia to have COVID here. And um, we were the first hotspots in April in the state. And with the new variant being out there and it's in Maryland, we don't know if it's here yet or not because I guess we're not testing for it. You know, we don't, we don't know what tomorrow brings. And if we go from, I mean, we're red right now. I don't know how much worse it can get. But if we go from red to on fire red, which it feels like we are right now, but if we go from, you know, this to worse, I think it's something that we would have to consider. And I know one of the plans you're looking at is school by school by school, but at the same time, we've got, you know, each school individually, but then we also have buses. Buses serve multiple schools. We have, you know, it. It sounds wonderful to say we can close one school here, one school there, one class here, but at the same time, you know, like we had an issue at the transportation department, if we have to quarantine the transportation department, we're remote no matter what. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's going to, no matter what plan we come up with, even if it's the perfect plan in the world, which I would love to have, I don't have enough confidence that we're going to get that, but, um, you know, plans are plans and reality is reality. And, you know, I just think we have to be prepared to shift gears at any point in time. Um, I will also, I forgot one piece of data that I think is important as we discuss any type of transition because Tuesday the 19th is the beginning of second semester. And we polled our parents, if you'll recall, in uh, end of November, beginning of December and said, do you want to switch? We have six, hundred plus students that when we when we do come back in whatever form we have to incorporate them into a new system for them they're either moving from virtual to on-site or they're moving from on-site to virtual <laughs> and they're going to be new to whatever system that we have so yes we would have students who are coming back into a system that they operated under for several months at the beginning of the school year but any change that we have, if we changed schedules, if we changed transportation routes, if we change anything, we have now not only the previous setup that we have, we have another 600 students that we've already changed teachers, changed schedules, set everything up for. And so any move, they're a whole separate subset that gets another move that we were going to have to incorporate brand new starting Tuesday. So it is an immensely complex situation. Uh, I just want to convey that. So if we do anything, anything different than what, <laughs> um, than what was originally planned for six weeks, <laughs> seven weeks, then there's a, a lot of moving parts that are going to have to be switched as well. Well, that sounds like the perfect valid reason for putting a pause button on it for at least the first week. Um, well, that's a, that's a great point. Um, and what I, what I would convey is that our original plan all along, all things being equal, 19th, we start back with the system that we had at the beginning of the year. 
Everyone knows it, everyone's familiar. It was uh, to the degree that we could make it effective. Now the community was not in red, so we were under a different set of circumstances. Um, however, one of the things that we've talked about is one of the ways that we achieved that level of success was because we gave everybody an opportunity to work their way into it and figure out um, the new system and the new layout and their comfort level and what they needed to do. Um, if you'll recall the way, way, way back <laughs> at the beginning of the school year, we gave everybody a two week roll in period where we brought everyone in one quarter of a class at a time. So we spent the first two weeks, 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, one day for the teachers to take all their information, maybe do some reconfiguration in their classrooms to their setup procedures to their, because if, as I said, we've got schools who have, you know, 50 more kids one way or the other in them. So the thought is that with that model, it could, um, it could have a couple of advantages. Number one, when we did that before, transportation had several weeks <laughs> to be able to go through all the rosters and then completely redo their transportation routes and keep families together. They would need at least a week to do that. So any plan that we come up with that isn't everybody coming on site every day we need a week to prep for that. So the, uh, in terms of a, a model that would let us get back to where we wanted to be, if we were, if we had a planning week next week, and then the week after we did exactly what we did in terms of a roll in for the start of school, where we brought everyone in 25% at a time for everyone to prep. And then that week, that first roll in week, in theory, based on what we've gotten from WVDE, we should have the vaccines for every single person who signed up so far to have the first round of vaccines. So every single person who's asked for it should have had the first round. And at that point, we can either, if there's something in between that happens that's, uh, that is cause for alarm, the board can meet and extend that roll in session we can uh, then be prepared to uh, go back. So whether that uh, uh, roll-in period is one week or two weeks, that might be a point of discussion for the board. What we don't recommend is that the board enact a completely new system. Some of the things that we've heard from people are, oh, well, if you go, if half your class goes on A day and half goes on B day and uh, a, a different type of hybrid blended model, the reality of that is it would force every elementary and middle school teacher that we have to teach on site and virtual at the same time. Because if half your class is in there with you and then half of your class is at home and needs to be taught, that I will say, uh, uh, JLT, we've talked, we've met, we've torn through this. We would strongly recommend against placing that burden on our teachers. They have, they have worked and worked and worked and changed and flexed as much as anyone could humanly ask of a body. For us to turn around and tear every schedule up and change classes again and ask them to teach more on-site and virtual at the same time is just an unbelievable burden. And, and very much, if there's one thing that I could counsel again is not to put our staff through that. I just, I, I think it's asking too much. Dr. Gibson, this is Donna Joy. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Can ma you hear me? Yeah, yes. sorry. I'm, I'm at work outside on my cell phone Zoom and I don't know how long I'll have a signal. Um, is so the first your recommendation is the first week be used for planning can you clarify what you mean by that um dependent upon what thank you that's a good question dependent upon what the school board recommends if the school board uh takes a recommendation of 25 percent of the students coming in at a time we would have to redo all of our transportation routes keeping those families together adding the new uh, 500 
kids who are going to be an on site for the first time and contacting all of those families. That takes a good degree of manpower. If, if, if the board was going to require a, a completely new system, like half at home, half on virtual every single day, we would need that week and probably more. I mean, number one, probably to pick the teachers up off the floor, but um, to uh, make all of the scheduling changes that we would have to. Essentially, we're gonna need that time if the board's gonna do anything other than what the original planning was, which was on-site kids go back and virtual kids stay virtual. Anything off of that requires us to switch gears, mostly transportation. Okay, so you're saying that we would come back next week as usual and take that week to plan for the future. Is that correct? We would, um, for a certain for a certain extent, yes, ma'am. Next week would be the recommendation would be next week would continue to be remote for students and a planning week. And then at least one week and possibly two following that, we would roll on site students back in exactly as we did to start this school year where we were getting everyone comfortable because we have so many new students coming in. And because there's a great deal of uncertainty and movement, that would be very, very small groups. Um, it would allow us and parents to gain some confidence in the system and us to see if there are any early harbingers of difficulty. And the board would have that data to be able to make uh, any decision that they needed to moving forward. Okay, I, that sounds like a good plan to me. I don't know if anybody has any questions. And then I, we would, whatever our plan is, we would need to submit to the West Virginia Department of Education. And then it is, uh, Mr. Birch is going to collate those and submit them to the West Virginia Board of Education um, for, I suppose, their determination of whether or not we're sufficiently in compliance. I believe as long as we have an honest intent and a plan to move back to on-site instruction at least two days a week. And what I would say is if we get through a planning week and then two weeks of 25% at a time, we should have a pretty significant group of our, all of our staff who, who asked for it, vaccinated with the first round. We should have the first round with their second vaccination. And we will have had two weeks to determine whether or not we see a spike whether or not our, our local. And then after that, we should return to the on-site plan as we had it. Um, there, the intent of the governor and of the West Virginia Board of Education was for us to get kids back in school. Quite frankly, and I don't know how many folks are aware of this, the governor put teachers ahead of some of the healthcare workers out in medical facilities because he heard over and over and over again and agree or disagree with him, he put school personnel ahead of many of our healthcare workers. And he did that specifically so we could serve children. So um, I, I am open to any suggestions from the board or any requests for us to make any alterations. And it is certainly your purview as a board to, to guide us on how you would like to do this. We're giving you every bit of data we have and our best thinking from me personally as a superintendent and as the mother of a child who was in on site and who is dying in virtual. And I don't mean grade wise, he's got straight A's and he is, he is a boy adrift, adrift without his friends, adrift without his teachers. Uh, it is a, it is a social emotional nightmare for families to have kids out of school this long. And we will be dealing with the after effects of this for years. And I know our teachers know that. And I know they want as much as anybody else to get kids back in. And I think this middle path of a week of planning and two weeks of 25%, very small, you know, four or five kids at a time, get everybody used to following our safety protocols again because they've been home for several months, you know, walking around Walmart without a mask on, 
you know, get them back into, here's exactly our rules, here's how we follow them. And that would put us, if we did the week of planning and then we did the two weeks of roll in with 45%, that would put us at February 8th for a full restart back on site. And we can always revisit that. And uh, so we have plenty of leeway time. Absolutely, Correct? yes, ma'am. You as a board can call. Now, in this case, we called an emergency meeting because we just received this information last night and uh, families and teachers need to know what to plan for Tuesday. We, we essentially have 24 hours, we have tomorrow um, as a work day before that decision has to be made. Uh, but you are entirely correct. Anytime during the next either two weeks or three weeks, whatever your decision is, we could do the first two weeks and then go ahead and plan a meeting at the end of that week and us give you statistics on how things have gone and you plan week by week. I don't feel very comfortable going back at all to uh, before all of our personnel have had the opportunity to get both vaccines. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and the only thing that I would point out to uh, uh, the staff are that we have utterly no control over the number of vaccines or when they arrive. We're given the schedule and typically we know week to week. The very first one I found out about 36 hours before it got here. We put together that clinic. Uh, I can add that to my resume of a vaccine clinician and uh, medical data inputter. But um, so I can't tell you because that would be a great point of information for you to be able to make this decision. If I could look at you and I could say, everyone will have their second vaccine shot by March 5th. Uh, that would be great. I have no idea. It may be March. It may be May. They may come back and say, well, we've decided that <laughs> one shot will do it. We're going to give everybody one shot and then these people too, or maybe no one too. Or, I, I have no idea. So I can't tell you what kind of timeline that would be. I can tell you right now, the number that we have, 583 total vaccines delivered, and I can tell you that we have 207 people more and that we've been told to anticipate that week after next, we will get those remaining ones so that everyone who to date has asked for the vaccine and hasn't gotten it yet will be vaccinated within two weeks. That's the only thing that we've been told to expect for right now. You know, it's a funny thing. Oh, it's not funny. It's not funny at all. We've got half of the school year going already. From everything that I can find out, <clears throat> talking to people and what have you, the kids are not learning, not anywhere near. I mean, they're, they're probably learning something, but they're not learning the amount of stuff that they should be in their grade level, they're going to be way behind for, ne for next year. I don't care what we do now. They're going to be, be way behind next year. Some of the parents think that all of the teachers will just catch, you know, just catch them up. Well, I'd like to see that. They, they work really hard to get them through one year at a time. They're not going to get them through a year and a half. It isn't going to happen. I don't care who they are, how good they are, how terrible they are, or whatever, or what level the kids are. That's not going to happen. And, well, you, how many, how many hours, how many thousand hours have you put in on this, on this thing since the start? Uh, our staff are exhausted. I will, that's a great point. Um, that's a very great point, Mr. Cable. We have, we have utterly exhausted our staff. We have started off with one plan. March 13th, they started off with one plan and it has changed a dozen times. We have ripped up class schedules. We have moved people. We have retrained them. 
We, we have changed every bit of business that we do from transportation to food service, to the maintenance folks, to the custodians, their jobs have completely transformed. Um, and I think at this point, we need to continue to have some grace. And I also have empathy and grace for these parents who are home watching their kids just, just die on the vine, for lack of a better metaphor. It, it's, it is a horrid situation. I am so unbelievably sorry that we're in it. But the best thing that we can do is try to offer you a third way right down the middle where we keep teachers safe, we honor uh, their concerns. We honor the fact that we are in red and we need to understand how this might alter what we do. But we also need to know that we have a duty to kids and that will serve them to the greatest extent that we can. And, you know, even, even as you saw, our, our own staff are divided on the communities divided on it. So that Right now, that's our best thinking, and it would, again, it will involve some change, but it not the greatest amount of change. Nowhere near the amount of change of ripping up every schedule and changing to a different type of hybrid. But the trouble with that is, and I'm, I'm just an old hard head, but I just, I cannot see, I mean, how many, how many times have we changed? Um, it's just too many, and we're going to change if we if we go with this. We're going to change a week from now, two weeks from now. But somebody's going to come up and say we got to change again. It, it's, as sure as I'm sitting in this chair, it's going to happen. It's not going to help the kids. It's not going to help the teachers. I don't know who it's going to help. Not going to help the state because they're running around in circles anyway. And I just think the best thing, the best thing we can do, the whole state, is say, okay, we're going to shut everything down until March, something like that. Because if if all the scientists know what they're talking about, and it seems to me like they have, because I've been following it. It's going to keep getting worse. It's going to get keeping worse. And what we're doing right now, like I say, next week or the week after next, you're going to be doing this all over again. And I think the best thing to do is, is close the thing down. And I know it's hard on the kids. It's terribly hard on the kids. But I think that they're, they're not they're not learning anything well i can't say they're not learning anything they're not learning up to the level they should be because they can't it's not their fault but i just don't think it's i i, I think they're wrong in doing what they're what they're doing i have from the word go and i haven't changed my mind there hadn't been anything to make it to make me change my mind it's making y'all work yourselves into the ground and it's, you know, it, work, it, it works for a week or a day or whatever, and then you're back to, back to it again. I, it just doesn't make any sense. But it sounds like we're trying to buy some time because there's $4 million at stake. So, you know, we want to keep everybody safe for as long as possible we're to keep kids home. And then I'm talking. Um, and I don't have a lot of time. I'm at work and it's a low signal. So um, I might, I've already lost signal a couple times. Um, I, I'm not sure your point about whether they're online or not, it, that they're not learning. The, the point is that we're looking out for people's safety and health, but at the same time, we risk losing $4 million. So you know, this will buy us some time to come back if we do have to come back in a week. So what? I mean, it, we're talking about people's health. So if we have to come back every day, whatever it takes. I don't know if you can hear me because I may have lost signal. Yes, we, can um, hear you. we can hear you, Dr. Joy. The way, 
is that your understanding, Dr. Gibson, um, that we're trying to appease this $4 million um, uh, coffer, and, but we want to you know, keep everybody safe at the same time. And um, we, need, we need to buy some time to come up with a plan. Um, I would not say that our that this plan is to um, is to ensure the four million dollars. I'll be honest. I don't think that the West Virginia Board of Education would withhold that from us. And uh, I, I, really, what I think this plan is trying to do is honor the concerns of the teachers and have the greatest amount of the highest level of safety that we can offer and continue to try to get kids on site because we have very clear data that that is what is best for them. So we're trying to balance every party's concern in that um, and still meet WVBOE's uh, requirements. So, and I don't know with the with that rolling um, plan to come back in, it is not two days a week. It is one day a week because it's a quarter at a time with the planning day. And that, uh, that doesn't completely meet WVBOE's uh, mandate, but we've been told that we'll have some grace. So the idea is that we would start with that, get data, and then to your point, the the board meets again, looks at where we're at and makes a decision for the following time. But I do think that we're going to have to submit a plan to the West Virginia Department of Education that says, we met, here's what our board has decided. Yes, we're rolling back in, but we're doing it on this time frame. We're doing it carefully. And here's our plan to get to two days a week within this time frame. And I have to say, if we, I would, I would not stretch that out into, you know, March or, you know, once you start getting past three or four weeks to, to roll that out and get data, then you're just, you're, you're purposely not following that. So, and you can, you may decide to do that as board. Once things come along and you see some data, you may sit right here, look at everything you see and say, Whatever those consequences are, bring them on. That's our decision. But right now, I don't think you have enough information about, well, you have tons of information, but not enough information about what's going to actually happen once we start rolling kids back in. And if we can do it in a very planned, controlled way that we've done before, that we've been successful at, that gives us our best opportunity. And it's best for kids and best for parents to see that we're trying to meet the needs of their children in ways that keep them safe and keep our staff safe. So you're saying that the reason you don't want to do full remote is because it's best for the children to have them back in school. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. To the extent that we can, yes, they are. We have um, a lot of, um, at least academic data at this point in terms of mental health data. We'll see when we get them back in. All of the mental health data is anecdotal at this point uh, because they haven't uh, come back in off of virtual for us to see that. But academically comparing those, you saw the data that we brought to the board at Christmas um, about the difference in performance between the groups uh, for this year and their, themselves compared to last year. And it's pretty, it's pretty stark, but we should do it in a way that's controlled and so that we see very carefully uh, how best to mitigate any, any existing risk. And it allows us to reach full initial vaccination of every staff member who asked for it. Well, it sounds like we have nothing um, to lose health-wise by having everybody go remote. It sounds like it's in the best interest for everybody's safety to do all remote. I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to put the safety of the employees uh, first 
Um, and I know that, you know, the students are already behind and it's unfortunate and they will have to get caught up. But, you know, if we don't have the teachers, we don't have the employees, you know, if they're out sick, um, I, I think that until we know more, <clears throat> you know, we have um, the, the new strains. So, you know, that's concerning. I was under the impression that if we just off the bat go uh, totally remote, we risk losing any assistance and we may need financial assistance because we may need to start vaccinating some of the students. Uh, yes, ma'am, you are entirely correct that if you go full remote, you are in defiance of the West Virginia Board of Education's directive and they have the full authority to withhold funding from you. Yes, they do. So um, in terms of staffing, that's a great point, um, Dr. Joy. One of the things, thank you very much, Ms. Loring, is we pulled um, all of the staff who are quarantined or isolated by location. Currently, we have 23 people in the entire school system. Um, the largest number we have, we have one school that has four uh, people and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 schools, uh, locations who have zero people who are quarantined or isolated in them. So uh, right now, um, that wouldn't be a factor, but I would also point out, as we said earlier, the board and the county health department retains their full capacity to close down individual schools should there be an insufficient number of staff to run it or should there be an outbreak. Uh, you continue to hold that ability even if you decide to return. Dr. Gibson, I, I've got a quick question. Um, I think if we look at protocol, we look at CDC guidelines, we look at the health department data, the, the one area where we are, if you will, not wearing masks and um, in a situation that could be considered dangerous in an enclosed room with you know minimal ven ventilation, depending on the age of the building, is the lunch. Um, we had you know an, an email regarding that as far as that is a fear factor issue, which I think is is general um, definitely acceptable and understandable and that if you're going to have a teacher that has a full classroom and then all the kids are going to take off their masks and they're all going to eat and the teacher's in there with them to me that is where you have an opportunity to spread um i i mean i agree with everything that's been said i don't know we don't know what's going to happen we don't know what's ha gonna happen with the other variant. We don't know if it's just gonna be a lot of asymptomatic issues. I think we all know somebody at this point who has died. We also know somebody who has had somebody in their household be affected and it didn't affect them at all. Um, and everything in between. So it is, a, it is a real piece. I understand we've gotta figure out the safety and security um, is there any possibility of doing half days instead of full days where we are providing lunch as take home, but we are not providing lunch? How does that work? Because then we don't provide lunch. We don't get paid for that as a day of education. I think if I remember correctly, obviously that's going to be an a hundred percent nightmare. Um, but if we have 600 more students. How many more are going to be entering the buildings? Is that even a feasible option? Um, and if we stayed remote, where's our technology data that says how many kids are we not servicing because they don't have Wi-Fi capability, even if we decided that remote is the only way to keep everybody safe? Um, and do we have um, enough you know, iPads. I mean, I know we've purchased them. We were waiting. We got a big bundle. And then from a educational standpoint, getting an update from Sean, 
how are our educational porters, portals going? Do we have every single grade level, every single class, and all teachers being able to add or access information that they need so that they're not making up whatever, trying to struggle to find what they need and even more work on them? Is there a place that they can access what they need and share drives on Google Docs or whatever else they've got options for? So it's not overburdening them too, if we have to stay out a little bit longer. I do agree, we have to figure out some timing wise because we can't just say based on what the health department has said, we're not gonna get community Im immunity until at least two months from now or possibly summer. So if that's the case and our our goal is as a board that until we get community immunity, we are never going back. Well, then we need to tell parents now, okay, sorry, we're not going back at, at all. We're done for the rest of the year. We have to be honest about it. That is the goal. Then that's what we're looking at. If the goal is then we want to make sure that everybody has at least one round of vaccine, then we're going to start then that's the goal. If it's everybody has two rounds of vaccine, I still think you're right. We don't have an end date for that because we have no idea what's going to happen in the next week and then in the next coming months. If they can make enough vaccines or if we'd even be the ones that get them. So I guess I'm struggling with, you're right, everybody on this Zoom and across this county has a different level of something that is going to make them feel safe. And we don't know what that is. So students overall, you're right, are going to be relatively safe as far as how it is affecting them overall. But one is too many. Staff, on the other hand, is where the risks are greatest for COVID-19 infection. The risks for the children are the emotional pieces that I think, yes, yeah, some of them we've we've it's past that. We're we're done. We have you know, children, I think, young adults, they were our children in our schools that we know have already, you know, done things that are horrible and they've suffered horrible consequences. And we can't go back, but we've got to figure out how to go forward. So I don't know if even we say, and I get it, it's always about the money and that's horrible. That makes me sick to think that they would dangle money over safety. I'm not surprised, but it makes me sick. And I don't care, they can keep their money and put it someplace. That's not the right thing to do. We need to have the local control to make the decision that's best for our county. And yes, we're gonna be different than Webster County and Nicholas County and some of the smaller areas. I It makes total sense, let them make their decision, but I'm not gonna make my decision based on money. They can keep it and I'll fight them for it. So, the decision has to be how do we get staff in safely how do we get students in safely and what other options do we have then to mitigate the lunch issue which i think is an issue we need to have a plan for because it's not a safe place to be if you're going to put even more students in classrooms with no masks and let them eat and then they're going to laugh and talk and share like they should but that is not a safe place how do we mitigate that and what can we do about it and then you know yes we can argue back and forth about the one day a week or two days a week or whatever the case may be. And is that even more detrimental to staff that one day they're here and then other days they're online and then some staff are really good with online and some staff are not and that's okay too, but then we have to have a better plan. And I have seen it work with um, other schools in the area that are um, not public schools, but that, yeah, the teacher just turns the Zoom on, it's in the room, and if you're home, that's fine. You just can listen and follow along. That's what you do. Um, you get, you still get access to the same information, but it's not taking the teacher away from the students in the classroom, and if you choose that, that's still your choice, but she's not responsible to, you know, do that, you know, for you if you want to stay home. I don't know what the right answer is with this, but we do need some more time. I do agree with that, but we can't just say uh, we'll, you know, we'll get back to you whenever because parents need to know. Some parents are getting called back into work. They have kids at home. You know, they're going crazy. The kids are going crazy. We have to make some kind of decision and then 
I, I know it's fluid, but I, I don't want to make a decision that then we have to go back to and say, oh, JK, we, we changed our, our mind. But I do agree that if we end up with this variant, it's already in Maryland and it crosses the border in the next three weeks and we have another huge breakout, then we don't, we're not going to have a choice. And that reality has to be out there too. We will not have a choice. It'll have to be shut down no matter what they say. So anyway, that's my piece. Mr. Osborne, I know you said that you know you don't feel comfortable going out and or going back until all the vaccines are out. Is that even with the 25% rollout or whatever it was? Is that how you feel? With the 25% rollout, I think that's just a token. The for us to show we're trying to get kids in school. And I think that's gonna be very difficult for our teachers. I think right now, over the next three, three weeks or so, we need to think about safety and the safety of our staff. And uh, uh, Laurie, I agree with you uh, in certain points, but this is an ever changing thing. So I, I don't know how we would say to parents, you know, that we're gonna be virtual for the rest of the year, or we're gonna be in school for the rest of the year this changes weekly or bi-weekly. And so I think this is a thing we're gonna to have to look at every two or three weeks to figure out where we are and, and what's going on out there. But I, I at this point, do not feel comfortable with, with bringing people back. And, and I feel very strongly that our staff, the health of our staff is very important at this point in time. So Dr. Gibson, what was the option about keeping everybody 100% safe? Can you give us that one again, please? I don't believe we offered one that keeps people 100% safe. I, if I had an option that kept everyone 100% safe, wow, that would be um, excellent. That would assure Jericho's college education and mama's retirement. But um, you know, it, it's like anything else. The thing to recognize, and, and here's the frustrating point, we control no one's behavior 100% um, of the time, not kids, not parents, not staff. So um, there is going to be a level of risk regardless of what we do. And there that level of risk varies. And you just have to decide based on all of the information that you have what level of risk is acceptable because they they're competing risks you guys have all said this we're, we're we're talking in circles it doesn't get any easier it is kids and their risk and it is uh staff and their risk and it is the community and their needs and risk and there is no perfect balance between those things there, there is no perfect balance so we have given you I mean, I have stacks of information here. We've given you every legal, every data point, every staff point. I have told you every single piece of information that there is to make a decision. And, uh, you know, it's it's clear as mud. Uh, it, it's, it's, I've told you everything that we had to make a decision and, and all of the things that we're capable of doing and the one or two things that we strongly advise against. So uh, outside of that, then, you know, I work at the will and we all work at the will and pleasure of this board. So well, let me ask a couple quick questions. Sure. First one is, I mean, last March we went remote and it was just a hot mess. No other way to describe it. It was crisis teaching. I think we can all agree that that was a, we were just thrown into the fire at that point and we were just trying to survive. And remote learning has evolved and I believe has gotten better. Now I'm talking pure instruction. I'm not talking about children's mental health because of the fact that that's a whole another situation. But um, remote learning from our county's perspective, I believe has improved. Mr. Dilley, would you agree with that? Yeah, I saw that our, our staff has taken a 
a strong stand in an effort to try to improve their outcomes in the remote learning atmosphere. So yes, I would say it has improved. Okay, because it was a little offensive yesterday when the state board said that remote learning is not learning. And I think that as a county, we have taken the hot mess from last March and improved it, improved it, improved it, and tweaked it, and tweaked it, and gotten it to a point where you would call it learning, wouldn't you? Yes. Okay. So it's not perfect. It's not um, providing the mental, you know, friendships and everything else that these kids need as children, but it's at least providing learning, correct? Yes. Okay, so now it sounds like we're weighing risk. Risk of one is <coughs> risk or, you know, the state board's risk of coming down on us for doing what they don't, not doing what they want us to do versus health risk over here. And it's the health of our staff that, you know, it sounds like we're just weeks away from getting to the point where there, that risk is minimal or at least a lot decreased by a lot once that second vaccine hits. So, um, and what I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, fellow board members, but from what I'm hearing from you guys is you're willing to take the risk over here of the financial consequences, but we're not willing to take the risk over here of people's health and safety. Would you agree to that or disagree? Here's Ms. Ogden? I agree. Mr. Osborne? Agree. Joy? Yes, I agree. She said yes. Okay, that's what I thought I heard. So, um, our first and foremost, it sounds like children's safety and staff safety is what we need to make our decision based on. So at this point, you know, I'm not so sure that we can move forward with that plan of rolling back unless, I mean, I know and the side of the room is probably about to explode on me right now, but I know we have spent so much time and effort making the worst case scenario as safe as possible. I know we have gone through a lot of planning, a lot of structure, a lot of reconfiguration to make it as safe as possible. Um, now with the new variant coming in, I don't know how that's going to impact anything else. And the fact that we are Jefferson County and 80% of our population, you know, work-wise leaves the county and goes to either Virginia, DC or Maryland that does not help us as a county as far as keeping things out or in. Um, I mean, I, from what I hear, it doesn't sound like we're ready to go back in person at any, you know, percentage. Is this where we are? Well, I think the positive side and what you're saying is when we do go back, period, the slow re-entry that we experienced at the beginning of the year to be able to maintain safety and security for staff and students, I think is a good plan. We know what kids are changing um, or you know, adding, subtracting. I know we've gotten emails even in the last week, I've changed my mind, I want in, or I changed my mind, I want out. I'm not coming back in there. So to be able to create a plan that we're going to go back when we can secure that all of our staff has gotten their second dose of vaccine, which should be 30 days. Um, in those 30 days, we're going to create that plan anyway of what it's going to look like with the additional students to get on those buses and get in there at a one week and a one week uh, with a smaller percentage however the percentages need to work out to meet the mandates that the state is requiring and then know that you know it's definitely not going to be next week um, and then hopefully that will maybe give them the option opportunity to look at that to say look we do have a plan but this is how we feel because it is a hot spot and we are not webster county we we have to handle this a little bit differently 
And for right now, we have to stay remote in a planning phase for the next, you know, I don't know, Dr. Gibson, 30 days. How, how long is it going to take to get to, I mean, I know we're not on the schedule, but you're supposed to have a vaccine within 30 days, the second dose, or is the first one no longer good? Do they even know? Um, I think we need those questions answered, but then at least it gives our community an opportunity to know this is the plan. We can change this plan. Yes, we may have to if the variant comes in and, and blows the rest of it up, but at least we have something to start with to give the state. That's my thought. I agree with you, Laurie. I, I think that uh, right now we need time and, and uh, we need time to evaluate where we are and what we need to do. Uh, I don't think we need to bring in kids, but we need to have some time to think about uh, the process of how we want to bring in those children when we want to bring them in. And I think bringing them in at a small amount at a time is a good idea. Um, I can convey if everything goes exactly as um, planned, predicted, uh, we would be giving the third uh, group their first vaccine on January the 28th because they keep it the same day of the week, which has been a Thursday. And 28 days from then would be February the 25th. So all other things being equal and in some ways perfect, February 25th would be the date on which uh, everyone would have had their second round of vaccine and have reached, uh, per the health experts, 95% immunity. So on the calendar, how does that look then for if they have the second dose of vaccine at that point, how does that look for the school calendar for March or? Uh, can you please repeat that, ma'am? How does that look for the school calendar if that date is February and apparently that's a Thursday? What's the following Monday? March 1st. Would it be possible to, um, you know, I know we've got five or 600 kids that it would be their first day in school for the first year. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And some children, it would be their first day in a new building because if they were in ninth grade, sixth grade, potentially third grade kindergarten. and kindergarten or first grade, um, it would be their first day in a building. Would it? be possible to um, just have some sort of little orientation for those children to come on Friday the 26th of February and then roll back into school on Monday, March 1st? Um, absolutely, ma'am. Several of the principals have, uh, and kudos to them, they've really tried nine ways to Sunday to, you know, uh, keep their staff safe, help keep their parents happy. And they uniformly said if they could bring that group in uh, separately or slightly beforehand so that they could orient them uh, ahead of time because they haven't set foot on that campus, they would really like to be able to do that. So uh, I think that they would be very appreciative and the families would appreciate that for their kids. I mean, this is pushing everything back six weeks from today. I mean, we've been in this situation for 10 months now. I know six weeks is a long time in the life of a child, but at the same time, if we're talking about the other alternative where it's a two week rollout where they get, you know, one day a week, you know, they're only getting 25% of an education anyway. So, you know, they would be missing, you know, a couple weeks of school plus two days the first two weeks. So, I mean, it's really only missing two weeks of school. And we're talking about K through eight. High school, that's a whole different story because they're remote no matter what because of the fact that we're red. So we're just talking K through eight. So if we were to compare what we're talking about now to your original proposal, which would be next week planning week, then two weeks of slow roll, and then it would be three weeks of full instruction. So it's really three weeks delay that we're talking about. 
buying six weeks with only three weeks of instruction, that would be different. Mm -hmm. So what do my fellow board members think about like an orientation for the new students on February 26th and starting class on March 1st? I say starting class, starting in person. I mean, we would continue remote until then. We don't get a nice six weeks vacation. But. Well, I'm in agreement with that. And, and I think we, do, we need to look at this, you know, every often because things are changing all the time. So, you know, after three weeks, we're going to have to take a look at this and see if that's where we need to go. But at this point, that is how I feel that we need to keep people safe. I think it's a good idea. I also feel like if we can, um, you know, have our service personnel and, and uh, teachers unions as well, reach out and just everybody kind of be able to share and figure out, are there some things we can do to mitigate lunch? I know some teachers were taking kids outside for lunch um, to try to, you know, avoid those kinds of things or open windows. And now we're going to be a little bit too cold to do that. Um, it'll get a little bit warmer by March, which is good. And we may still have those opportunities, which will be good. It should get us through the coldest month. Um, so we can have some better ventilation in classrooms, which I think is also a good way to avoid some of that spread. But if somebody else can come up with some other good ideas to be able to share with each other. Ms. Laura, you were going to say something earlier and I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no, it's fine. I was just going to... Um you know, make a point too with the um, 23 quarantines and isolations right now, um, you know, it's, it's low because um, we've had the smaller population within the school and opportunities for teleworking. So had everybody been back in the building, this number would obviously be inflated because of the um, close contact that you would have to make and you'd have to isolate those groups. So, so this number is, is lower because we're, um, you're not full in. Thank you. So I just wanted to make sure I made that that notation of, of reality. Thank you. Yeah. And then um, one additional comment I would make is we all need to work together on this. And I know that as a board, we supported the staff last board meeting by um, extending the, what, what was the name of it? I'm sorry. FFCRA, the FFCRA, Family First. The, the Family First Act, where, you know, you get paid time off and things like that. But it needs to be a two-way street, and we really need the staff to do their part and pull their weight and, you know, do what's right, <laughs> do the right thing um, as far as, you know, going out and having meals with large groups and having you know congregating outside of the building off school hours and you know not wearing masks and i mean just please please do the best that you can to you know do the right thing and help us you know combat this that's just my personal opinion not the board's opinion just to make that clear um i'm sorry were you gonna say something okay. so would anybody like to make a motion as to what our plan is or isn't so i make a motion that we um are going to wait to bring in children. <clears throat> the new students coming in on Friday, February, I believe it was the 28th or the 26th. 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 And then um, additional students will then start on March 1st based on what plan that uh, Dr. Gibson and the staff come up with that is safe and secure to make sure all students come back. Um, and it also secures the safety that anybody who wants it had the opportunity to have the two uh, doses of vaccination so we can get back to the business of education. 
So we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Osborne, second. Any further discussion or comments? Right. I well, think we're getting close. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Cable. I was just going to say, I, this is getting somewhat in the direction that I was talking about. It didn't what I, <coughs> but I'm not going to vote against it because we need to get back on track. So I just want to let you know. If you have any other suggestions, now would be the time, though. No, I'm not going to do that. But what you're talking about is as close as we're going to get. So. Okay. All right. So there's a motion on the table to um, have new student orientation on site February 26th. And that's the new students returning from coming back into on person from the remote learning that they had. And then March 1st, returning everyone on site. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Ms. Joy, did you vote? I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, I'm trying to um, preserve the Zoom by not using the video. Yes, I agree. All right, session passes. Any board members have any other? <laughs> yeah. Nothing like a little humor to end your meeting with. Yes, ma'am. Everybody likes an audience. Yes, ma'am. All right. I believe we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you.